Happy Christmas, everybody. On the 25th of December, as Christmas rose northeasterly in the least, how three wise men settled into their homes, and children all around placed their heads into their beds for sleep. And it was on this day, one decision was made that we might live in perpetual harmony, and with free will, despite our sins. And this saviour was given a name. Hello, everybody. Good night, Dan. Good night, good night, Mommy and Daddy. Mommy. Mommy, say good night to Daddy for me. All right, I'll tell him good night for both of you. Mommy, can I have a drink of water? You've had a drink already. Now, children, it's time to go to sleep. Hello everybody, thank you for turning up this day, I hope you enjoy being here as much as I'm enjoying being here. If this is a clear day, we might consider enjoying the sky, but as it is, some issues are clouding the occasion. You will appreciate dearly the right to have your sins removed. This is called sanctimonial depletion. Let us ask now for those of you who wish to have any meaning in this life as one who has sinned and one who will remain a sinner he will turn to his creator and say how much he has sinned. He will beg for forgiveness and he will take all tears to be measured. This is a time for celebration. Now you'll notice that I'm the only one here with a cup of coffee. That is because I'm the vicar. I am the only one allowed a cup of coffee in here, and I will drink my coffee. This is his story. A sound, followed by a very basic and infinitely repeated phrase. I must remember to replace the batteries on the radio. Where are we some some stair trips? This is a good idea, I think. I'd rather be safe. I'd rather be safe than sorry, I think. Here's a man blues, blues. That was Johnny Be Good and uh, ain't got those rhythm and blues blues. Focusing your attention. So by the time you've read this, you'll have realised that um, the waste paper basket is under the door where the floor is supposed to be, and the p piece of flooring has been resituated above the telephone on the wall. Very annoying. Have mostly old people there shaking hands and saying, Well done. Good news, yes, yes, good news. Shaking hands, holding tea. 
very white hair, these old people. Wouldn't you agree? And they stand there holding their feud and generally pumping around in their big middle class garb and making a bloody great stench. Some of them are far too fat for the area and will soon lose their work. Some of them are. Black jackets on and hop around and let people push fences back and forth at them. And some of them observed birds just perching on other people's shoulders. You know, you know the story, don't you? Yes, you do. I am the only one who awakens at exactly this time. Evergreen and bottle swag graces the patio wall at the home of Miss Frances Smith. The lighted arrangement uses five bottles, three long and two round shapes of different sizes. Wide neck bottles are most suitable for inserting Italian lights. To copy merry yuletide wall decoration, Clip in half a fine wire measuring seven times the length of one of the long bottles being used. Twist pieces together. Gnome-like figures line up at attention, and they'll get plenty of attention too. These clever little creatures may double as gift wraps or toys, but whatever their role, the family will love them. Best of all, they're not hard to make. Basically, they're just already been used milk cartons, but they might just as easily be cardboard boxes in graduated sizes. When boxes are ready, they are decorated with scraps of felt, bread cloth or corduroy, bits of coloured paper and puffs of soft white cotton from the medicine cabinet. Finishing touches They, they turn up and they knock on her door and she welcomes them in and makes them dinner and they tell her why these three fairly eclectic gentlemen are all together and are embarking on this very long journey and she's really taken with this story and um, she really wants to go with them and they say yeah you know Babushka you should definitely come come with us and she says um, okay but um, I, I've still got so much to do here so um, so I'll just sort of finish tidying the house I don't I don't really have anything that I could give as a present so I'll, I'll find something for a present and then and I'll, I'll hurry after you and I'll catch up with you and they said, well, we think you should really just come with us now. And she said, no, 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 you know, I just want to get these things sorted and then I'll, and then I'll come. And so the three made I leave the next day and she tidies the house and finds some presents. But of course, she never catches up with them. And so when she finally locks up the house and leaves, she has a big bunch of presents, um, which she then just gives out to children as she goes looking for the Magi, trying to catch up with them, never ever catching up with them. And something just sort of so incredibly moving and resonant about this sort of story, some kind of caesura or a, a hiatus where it's constantly deferred, everything is constantly deferred and you're constantly trying to catch up with something that's always, always going to elude you. So that's why I particularly love that story. And I think it's that, it's that sort of sense of kind of hardship and and the elusive that that then en ends up characterizing something about winter storytelling that I really like. So, and I really remember when I was 10 and um, we were allowed a sort of new 
book or a new story for Christmas. And I remember choosing one which is about a Christmas card. And um, the Christmas card was sort of about a family who had rented a cottage or they were going to stay in some desultory, dilapidated college, uh, cottage in the middle of nowhere. In, and w when they get there, it's very late at night, there's lots of snow. It's been really difficult to find this place. It's sort of a bit eerie as well. And they um, go into the um, cottage and they've been left a Christmas card. And the Christmas card is sort of, looks just like a wintry scene. And then as the kind of days unfold, the children or the child in the story realises it's, it's always a picture of them. So wherever they are, that's what the Christmas card shows. And so then she needs to find who, who made this card, who left this card, and she's sort of wandering through this kind of dark, wintry, snowy woods with this kind of utterly uncanny card, the sort of uncanniness of, of searching for something and elusiveness and mystery and so on. Friend Emma, um she writes this beautiful uh, way she talks about binoculars in this piece of writing that she has produced about how when you look through binoculars you're looking at uh, your own past it's as if you're seeing memories that have happened uh, to you and I absolutely know what it is that she means should we try and put it to the Mm. You have to do it up to the uh, the black square there. There's something very peculiar about the images that you see through binoculars, partly because all of these things have to be aligned just right. And even then, it takes an awful lot of concentration to keep your eye and your hand steady and for you to really focus on the thing that you're looking at. And... And so then you see uh, just the, the briefest snippet of a bird, black on the white sky, and you start to see it as if it's a stamp on a page. And through the shapes, you can start to ascertain the kind of bird it is. Um, but a lot of it really has to do with your own memory and even your own imagination. Um, you're perceiving what you're seeing in a different way when you're looking at things through binoculars. And I really love that. I've always really loved that a lot. And I remember seeing trees through binoculars, snow-covered trees, and then uh, horses. And once, a long time ago, I was on a boat in the summer, and I was given a pair of binoculars to look at an island nearby, it must have only been maybe a thousand meters away from us, um, and it was a calm sea and a beautiful summer's day, and it took me a long time to see um, these creatures on the beach of the island, and like I say, you know, the light has to be just so, and I saw uh, little snitches or snippets of these birds they were they were huge birds absolutely enormous birds the size of emus but they weren't emus and for a moment I thought that I was the first person ever to see these particular birds it really felt like that it was um, it was an island that not many that it wasn't habit in, in it wasn't habitable by humans it was a very small island. It was an island only for, uh, you know, wildlife, really. And, yeah, like I say, for a moment, I felt this, this rush uh, seeing an animal that I just could not categorize. I couldn't recognize it at all. I knew that it was some kind of bird, but their legs, it actually looked like, it sounds a bit odd, but it looked like it had women's legs. <laughs> very thick, um, but shapely very human legs essentially very odd very peculiar and only because i was watching it through binoculars watching these birds through binoculars yeah that was good
<laughs> Little Jack Horner sits in a corner eating his Christmas pie in this miniature tree globule of papier mache. To copy trinket, paint stage floor brown and walls yellow. Carve a tiny body of balsa wood, top it with wood bead head, and attach wood dowel legs and arms with glue. Sculpture tree and base, bench and wreath from soft balsa wood. Sand all pieces with a fine sandpaper. Mary had a little lamb, its fleece was white as snow. And he's following her to a little red schoolhouse carved of balsa wood in this miniature tableau. To reconstruct this frolicsome scene, paint the sky light blue, brush near the top with a fluff of white clouds, paint the grass with a cool green enamel, model tree of three quarter inch thick balsa wood or plywood and paint forest. If the man for whom you are making a gift appreciates interesting driftwood, he will be very pleased to receive the hand-finished Madonna and Child wall panel shown at right. Panel was designed by Mrs. Robert Langner and displayed at the San Francisco Museum of Art Christmas Party. Mrs. Langner was inspired to make panel after discovering the termite and shipworm eaten piece of wood on a Washington beach. When a second piece of lighter coloured driftwood was located, the child was added to the design. The driftwood pieces were given from three to five coats of sealer, sanding after each application. To get highlights on the faces, the areas were sanded more often. Backing for figures was made by covering half an inch thick plywood with green velvet, stapling edges to the back, then framing with moulding. The moulding was first stained with a wiping type of stain, then treated with... The figure of St. Barley disappeared, and left me alone in that room, stone cold and dehydrated. Only the silence hung around me, and my every action and thought was penetrated by its depth. As I listened, Silence was the only response, as books nestled on tables, as tables gently marked the floor, only silence was created. And I felt that there could never be any such sound in the world as a figure known as Saint Barley putting his language forth to be heard. Sounds of such a level would surely be attempted only by those driven by either the greatest bravery or the most horrendous stupidity. Against this present silence, it was obvious that such sound would rip apart the very fabric of our bodies. Such a risk, I could almost sense the overbearing contempt of any leading scientist. By this reasoning, I felt myself assured that the situation I had experienced with St. Barley must have come from some disagreeable food, or as a fantasy in sleep. To wait for three guiding spirits seemed to be the last thing I would ever do. So I waited, and within the hour came the first spirit. You were very quick getting here. Yes, I'm working in the area at the moment. Working? Yes. Yeah. What sort of thing? I'm, um, singing. Singing. So, you're the ghost of Christmas past? Yes, I am. <clears throat> and I'm here to offer you a glimpse of my world that you might take and learn. An alternative way of living. Please walk with me across your room and stare through this rectangular space normally occupied by a window.
appreciate the wonderment of the activity in store. So who are these people? These particular people are my family, but they are an example of the larger culture in which they live. You are to view them and learn. They are eating right now? This is a meal time, yes. We call eating periods meal times. I see. But please learn by observation, not by the answers I give. It is the only way for true learning. But might I learn from the perspective you reveal by your answers just as well? Your people appear to be struggling to cut their food with tiny wood saws. The tools seem ill-suited to the task. My man, a word of advice. Cease this relentless search for answers. Instead, just learn. So this is the culture of your whole land, or just your family? I have to go. The ghost of Christmas past left, and so I waited for the second spirit. A knock came at my front door, a heavy hand, full of wisdom. Down the stairs, opened the door. Nobody lay behind. A window smashed above me. I stepped outside and turned around to peer up at the jagged broken glass on the second story. Behind, there was movement. Somebody appeared to be shifting furniture around in my living room. So it was to that room I returned, closing the front door back up the stairs. Inside, various items fluttered in the new breeze. I heard some creaking outside the window, crossed the room urgently to catch what I might, and there below me caught somebody at ground level leaving the base of my drain pipe and rushing off into the distance. For a moment or two there he was, getting smaller and smaller, until he completely disappeared, and then he was gone. So I turned around and looked at the mess. Resting face up on the table in the centre of the room, a note took my attention. It said, Dear Ebony, we tried to find you at home, but you were out. We know you weren't in and sleeping, because after looking all around the house, we made a great deal of noise by breaking things and received no audible reply. We hope this note takes your attention more effectively. Sorry for the inconvenience. Yours, the ghost of Christmas present, also known as Intrusion Theatre Company. P.S. I've taken all my props, i.e. your belongings, away with me. The telephone rang. I answered it. Hello? Hello there. Is that happen now? This is the ghost of Christmas yet to happen. I've decided I don't want to pay all that money to travel over there, and thought you should pay instead. You should come over here. Over where? Catch the next plane. Where to? You'll find out when you get here. It's the next plane you need to get. Hurry up or you'll miss it. I'll see you in seven hours. He hung up first. When uh, 
you are a little unsure of what's happening and you, uh, are, you there's, a, there's a sudden kind of watershed change in how you're uh, how you're feeling and you've kind of you're twigging little signs that something isn't quite as it was before it, it it's like, I suppose like in when there's some kind of accident or more positively when you're just on the edges of working out um, that there are people in your house and they've they've arranged a surprise birthday for you in the case of a surprise birthday you'll see that people people are in your house those sort of vague strangers you saw through the window suddenly someone you recognize very well and it, you're probably aware that it's your birthday I'd expect and you'd uh, see signs such as streamers and then you'd be quick so probably suddenly quite shocked and then overwhelmingly moved and uh, overjoyed that people have gone to this amount of effort in their love for you Chloe was a poor student at the time, as so as was I, and we were um, uh, we've been going out for about f about five months, and uh, she came down to Brighton where I was living from London um, with ten pounds, and she happened to have a few bits of shrapnel to supplement it, which meant that she could buy a ticket to Brighton just a single, and got a bottle of Buck's Fizz which I think is probably about two ninety nine, and a packet of Tesco cake mix which was 26 pence and she came down all the way to my house I knew nothing about this um, and she stood outside the flat where I lived and arranged this cake mix and Buck's Fizz artfully on the doorstep um, I think on the train she'd managed to write Happy Valentine's Day Ricky in uh, on plain sheets of A4 printing paper and she stuck them up onto the uh, the glass. And I think she'd given me a text message saying uh, I think something's going on outside and we were just saying how I probably didn't really understand what was happening because I don't tend not to pick things up quite so quickly. Uh, I went down the stairs um, I saw the front door, which was what was usually panes of glass, was now white, papery panes of glass with sort of vague sort of smudges on them. Because from the outside, I don't think this has worked out in this way that um, you could see what was written on them from the outside, but not from the inside. So I had to come down and open open the door to see what was pasted all over the door and um and then I saw this uh packet of cake mix and Buck's Fizz and looked out on the doorstep wondering what was happening still and then Chloe shouted boo <laughs> and jumped out of uh, a hedge. And held firmly by any member of staff to whom the situation is given. It goes something like this. All passengers must adhere to the aforementioned rules of conduct, and failure to do so on three counts will lead to the confiscation of his or her seat. Should a fourth count be measured, staff reserve the right to employ the passenger, unpaid, for the remaining duration of the flight. Any passenger forced to carry out duties will be expected to do so with strict adherence to airline company policy.
Would you like a cup of rosemary with some sugar in it? Or would you like to go to the woods? There might be wild animals there. Or you might find your soulmate. Or your soulmate. Or your soulmate. Or your soulmate. I will give you. I will give you mud to grow artichokes and sparkling water to wash your armpits and bubble soap to dance on the heavy snow. I will give you a pair of scissors and my shoulder to wander. In this string of time, I promise I will never be long enough or short enough or tall enough or big enough. And I will hold you till you say the salt is too salty, the sugar too sweet. I will hold you and whisper like this. Στο σανό, στο σανό μεγαλώνει το θεριό και θεριεύει και σκέφτεται κάπου κάπου πόσο μικρό έχει υπάρξει. I can see you in the dark. Your mustache is bigger than your eyes, which melt like bubblegum. This is your house. Don't you cry now. Don't you cry. It is all right, you will say, and not quite mean it. It lasts however it lasts so often. I have a heroine on my hair. She does not want to come down. She refuses like a scared animal, like someone scared. How long has it been since your last kiss? Your last cuddle, you will ask. Till you sang the last song. Sip your soup now, slowly. Don't you choke, boy. Don't you choke. Okay. Yeah, he had a twig at one end, as if moting the old Pinocchio shred. His bed was of mottled grey clay. And his wife, she couldn't stop opening the window. By the time the children had come home from school and cleaned up the mud that they'd spread up and down the stairs... What on that? Yeah, about fed up with you. You ain't like an hot tongue done to you. Tom! Oh! There you go! Someone's job to paint the clouds. And I remember I was about 14, and it was my job to put a belt on all the clouds. It's my job to gather the clouds and put belts on them to make sure they were smart for work. And, uh, so of course, uh, some clouds were ridiculous because they always broke in two when you squeeze the belt so tight. So you had to be quite loose, not, not loose enough for the belt to actually just slip off the whole thing because they were quite light things, clouds. They would often tip over the belt was too loose and the belt would just fall right off. So 
so that was my job for ages. Little Boy Blue is too busy sleeping to blow his horn and gather his sheep and cows in this memorable scene. Meanwhile, an enamel-painted, fluffy white cloud floats overhead in the clear blue sky. Deep green tree, silhouetted against the sky, shades the sleeping lad. Bushy yellow haystack under which Little Boy Blue sleeps is shaped by fraying and stacking natural rope in tiers. Yellow enamel paint gives the rope stiffness. Bits of the roping painted Whisks that have seen their better days and now lie in the bottom of a drawer or in a bin at the Salvation Army may be revived in a new capacity as holders for sanctuary lights. Interior designer John Wheatman created hanging fixtures for display use at Jackson's in Oakland, but the idea will work equally well in a corner of your living room, over a hall table, or by a bedside stand. To reproduce whisk idea, spray paint whisks, each with a different complementary Whimsical face will delight and amuse your children every day. Once you've copied this imaginative face, you'll want to make several more, combining shapes, textures, colours to suit your fancy. Designer Robert Winkwist of Manhattan Beach, California, originated this creature of fantasy using ordinary household material plastic placemat, coasters and straw fan, also ribbon, plastic foam ball and glue. Straw fan There is a precise moment at the end of every process where one needs to complete the sentence thereon and put their pen down and let that be the end. In early stages this might lead to a number of incomplete sentences, but should a particular type of process be repeated enough, one becomes familiar with the amount of work that can be finished in that restraint and at least reach the target with the beginning, middle and end in place. Of course, this means shortcuts must be made, and with a decrease in the available time comes an inevitable increase in the number of shortcuts that must be made along the way. And so it is that one must accept the length given for the necessary reflection of a past day's event, or never begin the next. Finally, after each event has waited patiently for the next one to be completed, and then the next, all come into alignment to be viewed as one image that can be stored as an abbreviation for future reference. It is at that stage that I find myself now, observing one image that cannot be described in words without it being restored in length to a complete twelve-hour day. The image has been stored and any errors from any stage in the process have been sealed into the conclusion, unlikely ever to be unearthed. And so, it is customary to prepare for the opening of tomorrow. A sound. A phrase. It's raining outside. I can hear it hammering against my tie. The sound. Okay. The man was scary through two instances. The first was that he uh, would frequently just tap at people's windows at night. The second was that during the daytime he would uh, perch solidly naked in the middle of the motorway holding up a placard that said 
I didn't rob the Queen or stab her recently. And the recently was underlined and there were two exclamation marks as if to say it wasn't done within the last two weeks anyway. So this man promised me a trip to the West Indies where he would seal me within uh, a special resin that would cast my body perfectly forever and uh, that he would store me as a paperweight in his wardrobe uh, for a rainy day to happen and then on the rainy day he would place this large paperweight with me inside on top of his desk to stop the paper from actually getting wet as well as just holding the paper down so I served as a sort of umbrella sealant for the paperwork as well as stopping it from blowing away because there's nothing worse than spending two and a half hours setting up an umbrella of your favourite paperwork as you leave it outside and suddenly find that it's uh, been taken away by the breeze so you need a combination and uh, you might say that by that action I was uh, the very first paperweight umbrella hybrid One of the things I got from my mum was a sense of being entitled to be interested in anything and yeah just that all learning was available to me and that it was a good thing to be interested in stuff and not something that you ever needed to hide and I think unfortunately I think that's actually still quite a rare thing for girls to be taught by their mothers that they don't need to hide being smart and being interested and I think one of the times that um, that, that really crystallised as a feeling for me um, I can remember being about 12 and being in the kitchen and um, we had all these navy blue formica doors on all the cabinets and they were completely covered in yellow post-it notes that were covered in really, really tiny Greek script. Well, I think my mum must have been working on a book of some kind. Um, and at the same time, she had kind of started this collage on the wall next to the cooker. Um, and I can remember there was this amazing picture of Frida Kahlo that she had cut out of a magazine or something. There was a postcard of uh, Derek Jarman being canonised by the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence and there was um, a picture of Katie Lang and this would have been a time when she was not really at all well known in the UK um, and I can remember kind of standing in the kitchen and looking at all of these things and thinking I have no idea what this stuff is, I don't know about any of it but I didn't feel frightened of that or kind of left out or annoyed or disinterested I felt excited because I thought I don't know but I will know and I will I remember feeling I am never going to run out of stuff to be interested in you know and I still feel like that and it's a kind of it's just the most extraordinary protection for mm. life to just mm. always feel there's stuff, there's more stuff out there. Okay, so let's say this, this is the deck of the ship and I remember it was fantastic, it was really windy and there was no one there, presumably because it was windy and cold and um, so everyone was, you know, downstairs in the kind of shopping area or just sitting down or in the restaurant area. And, and there was a little section over here which was gated off. So this is a gate, if you like. And here there was a kind of, uh, well, this was actually a wall. Here there's like a kind of structure. And this is probably the door you went into to go back down. And here there was a gate and there was a kind of, 
uh, I don't know what you would call it. Uh, I mean, it's just a floor, like in the same way that this is all floor. Um, but here it was totally unsecure, whereas all, all along here you had a very tall, what do you call it, like a not banister, but railings. Mm. Like, so, so all along here you'd have the railings and uh, for, you know, so as to not fall into the sea, <laughs> obviously. And here, though it was open, uh, you didn't have the railings. So that's why you had this kind of gate. Uh, and there, there was a sign that said, uh, no access, you know, or, or something, no access. I should turn this around, shouldn't I? Let's see, beautiful drawing. I was in a certain kind of high, of high on life, and where I just felt, um, kind of why not you know so I climbed over the gate here and uh, I was very uh, I kind of went here very close to the wall there was only like I don't know maybe one or two meters not more to the edge and I remember standing here thinking what the hell am I doing this is the most dangerous Thing anyone could do. We're, we're literally in between France and England. I'm the only person out here. If I were to fall, I would die, or n maybe not immediately, but after, you know, shortly, or after a while. So I was cautious, but as well as very excited. My heart was racing. I felt really excited. I must have been about 21, 22. I think 21, or maybe even 20, maybe something like and so what I did is I had my back to the wall here I, and I started to really slowly, I crouched down and I basically just lay flat on the ground with my head just here. So I was kind of, so I had my stomach on the ground, I was like literally lying flat on the ground. And then I really slowly started to inch towards the edge and then just enough to basically stick well, my head or to, to be able to see basically and so here was the the edge of the ship and all of a sudden the sea kind of below opened up and um, and it was beautiful I remember like or here it was all white along the edge and it's extremely tall it was like looking down from a building it was very very um, very very high up and to totally exposed and and it was a extremely dangerous position but I really had this lovely um, experience in, in that moment of like, pleasure of being alive in the most basic elemental way possible. It felt fantastic to be uh, where I was. <laughs> oh, I need you too much. And even now, we haven't eaten at all. <laughs> Happy-go-lucky toy soldier with hands on his hips needs plenty of room to stand guard in front of your house. He's over six feet tall. Use him by your fireplace during wet weather. Other times, let him flank your entry to protect a giant basket of gifts wrapped especially for guests invited to a party. To copy Tall Soldier, there was only one of a long row of soldiers in the display windows of Abbey Rents in Los Angeles. You need very few materials. 2 by 4s poster paint. is coiled up and it, if you look at it under a magnifying glass the coil is made up of another even finer tiny coil it's called a coiled coil the more compactly a filament can be wound the less heat it loses to the surroundings and the brighter it glows
Bill starts the ball for the bottom, Nell the ball for the middle. A little snowball like this grows into a big snowman. The farther it rolls, the larger it grows. The snowman will stand where the largest snowball stops. How big the ball for the body has grown. Teamwork helps to make a good snowman. Oh, look out! Charlie, come and help us. Coming. There it is. Now, the snowman needs a head, and Charlie has it. A head for the snowman. That's right, Bill. Make his neck strong so the head won't fall off. What are Charlie and Nell looking for? Two days later, I opened my eyes. Once the balance between the patches of light and dark had been made, and the colours became apparent, I saw faces. Faces all around me with their mouths opening and closing, lips touching, pulling apart, revealing teeth which were touching before they pulled apart. Opening and closing lips and teeth like that for ages. Really for ages. And I was just accepting it as fine, until they began to look annoyed, all these faces. And then I remembered, and I felt so stupid. for the first time and determined not to miss a single new homemaking idea. They're busy just making choices and welcome solid information in concise form. That's really blazing there, isn't it? Mm. So, Fitzcarraldo. Yes. Fitzcarraldo is the name of our boat, and it's a film by Werner Herzog, in which, correct me if I'm wrong, Simone, because I can't really remember the exact story, but basically they're looking for gold. Is it set in South America? Yeah. I think it's somewhere in South America, and they want to get some gold it's down a certain part of the river but for some reason they can't take the boat down the river open an opera house it has got opera is a big part of it isn't it i can't remember but why why do they have to take the boat the other side of the river then if, uh, if they want to open opera house i'm not sure maybe there's something about the amount of money it's going to cost to build the opera house. Yeah. And there's some gold in the mountain. Anyway, the crux of it is that they have to get to this bit of the river that is not accessible via the river. So in order to get this kind of steam paddler boat to where they need it to be, they employ some local tribes people and take this boat over the mountain. Um, 
and they do succeed. Yeah. Yeah. And it's quite amazing seeing it because they actually did it in the film. There was no way to kind of fake it. It was before the days of CGI and stuff. So they really actually took a boat over a mountain. And for us, um, getting a boat was a bit like climbing a mountain or taking over taking a boat over a mountain. It was like a big thing. So it seemed a fitting name. And we like the sound of the word Fitzcarraldo. <laughs> Fitzcarraldo. Yeah. It's just a nice nice name. We did wonder if it was a bit of a bad omen because they actually crashed the boat in the end after they've got it over the mountain. It sort of gets caught in these rapids and um, it's all a bit chaotic. And the first day we were bringing the boat in, we'd done a one day course on someone else's boat to learn how to steer the boat, but we haven't done much driving. And the first day we took it out, there was a weir and a lock next to one another. And it said sort of stay away from the lock. <laughs> uh, stay away from the weir. And I was waiting to some, for someone to come up out of the lock. I was going backwards and forwards. And then the rear of the boat got caught in the current for the weir. And it was like, yeah, our first half day of moving the boat. And Simone was off on the side because she was going to open the lock. And I was on the boat on my own trying to turn the boat around. But every time I did it, I'd get pulled back by the current. So I just could see our new boat and our new home and our everything. <laughs> floating down the river mm. <laughs> and uh, eventually a guy, an old grey-haired man smoking a rollie came up out of the lock and he just gave me a hand signal. It quite obviously said, go back up the river, turn around and come back down again, which is what we ended up doing. And, uh, and so the boat was safe. And touch wood since then, there's been no major crises of a Fitzgeraldo nature, <laughs> just minor skirmishes <laughs> bumps and scrapes yeah perhaps you should wait in time you'll be told where you are and whether it is best to be there this is a thing to do I think to just wait sooner or later you'll be told you'll receive a message through the post so you wait, and you wait, and one man bears some resemblance, so you think so, and he never knows to disprove it. And one lady becomes a distant relative, and why not? Place yourself in there somewhere, try on a new hat, and your father was a policeman. And if you are wrong, if you come off the rails, you will be put right. Sooner or later you will be told, You'll receive a message through the post. I was at the centre of some kind of crowd, unable to see anything, surrounded by voices, all laughing and chattering. In my right ear, one voice was hovering with advice, and from what I could make out, telling me not to be distracted and to hear what he had to say. Meanwhile, I remember once I went into a zoo and I was chased down this concrete ramp into the area where the giraffes are stored when they're not on display, uh, which is a very small cramped area with ten giraffes occupying the space of what would be about four large cars so there wasn't much room for them to move uh, and to stop them getting diseases in the winter months he'd fill them with antibiotics of course but that's a different story really I was, uh, I was going down there I was chased down there um, it, and 
the um, all of a sudden I was locked in. I thought, you know, this was some sort of disaster, of course, because I was quite young at the time, um, because and I'd never slept overnight in a giraffe storage area before. Um, and the overall sensation I had was that I'd never get out or something, or that I wouldn't at least get out in time to consume enough water or food to serve me well, you know. Uh, which was true, in the end I, I sort of dehydrated and passed out and there was I think there was a, a saintly program or a program about saints on television at the time because there happened to be a television in there and um, it was like songs of praise or something f but only for saints and they would sing their hymns and so on and it, one of the hymns was about um, sheep and shepherds and that sort of thing and how they should be converted to saints and uh, I remember a very stark image uh, where this program was interrupted and my face came up on the screen all of a sudden on the television screen with a sort of it's supposed to say lost as then you'll see this child you know lost everyone's very worried about him because, uh, you know, he went missing at the zoo because he was chased somewhere. We don't know where he was chased to, so please help us find him. You know, it's supposed to say that, but instead it said wanted uh, for breaking and entering and attempting to steal a fake torso from the Madame Tussauds Popeye exhibition, which happened to be going on at the same time but in France, though. Obviously, I was distraught because they were, instead of having people searching for me to save me, they were searching for me to arrest me. And the police were looking instead of the usual search people. And the police don't have torches. It was quite worrying. And the police have other jobs as well. So they were probably getting distracted quite a lot. And that prolonged my anxiety as I lay suffocating in this giraffe storage area. Anyway. Weeks passed and um, somebody finally decided to let the giraffes out and I was discovered in a mountain of hay just trying to see whether the clouds could form themselves into a message for me staring up into the sky, you know. And uh, they found me, someone saw me, shook me by the hand and said well done, you've been waiting a long long time, very brave of you. And then I was put into a police car and I heard the sirens only just because they sounded so far away I was so used to uh, being beneath the long long neck of a giraffe and I sort of had to get used to uh, the peak that this giraffe was talking but all close objects for some reason seemed a long long way away anyway they they caught me as they called it they slammed the door so hard that the seatbelt got caught in it and I said isn't this dangerous or against the law and they said yes but we don't care about you and then they drove on and until they got to the traffic light and then one of those big burly chaps with huge podgy shoulders opened the door for me and allowed me to unhook the seatbelt from the door finally they uh, threw me in a prison cell and the prison cell was about the size of 
uh, four large cars. They locked me in, and the next thing I was aware of was one person saying, I think I've lost the key, and then a second person saying, don't you have a spare one? And the first person saying, again, yeah, no, I don't have a spare one. And the uh, second person saying, well, never mind. Where should we go for lunch?